Today we're going to talk about Kingdom Protista, the garbage kingdom, and you'll see why I say that in a couple minutes. But first, what do you think malaria, ice cream, and toothpaste all share in common? Well, they're all protists. So this is just showing you different protists that are found within pond water. Okay, they're such a diverse group of organisms, about 60,000 different species. Um, they can be found anywhere there's water, moist places, leaf litter, bodily fluids, tissues. Um, they're very difficult to classify because they appear to have little in common. But they do share a few characteristics. And I just want to point out that they have evolved from monarans. We've developed a nucleus, mitochondria, chloroplasts, ER, Golgi. Okay, so they are all eukaryotes. They have a nucleus with that surrounding envelope. They have the organelles. Okay, they are um, microscopic for the most part, but they can be as large as five millimeters. They can be single cell, they can be multicellular, they can be autotrophs, heterotrophs, mixotrophs, and so forth. Reproduction, they can reproduce asexually by mitosis. Again, they have a nucleus. And sexual reproduction occurs from meiosis, conjugation, sigonan, sigonanny, excuse me, which is pretty much the union of two gametes. Okay, um, they can move, all right, they have flagella, they have cilia at some point in their life. Um, it's very different than the monarans. The eukaryotes have flagella as extensions from the cytoplasm, and it's bundles of microtubules covered by the plasma membrane. Okay, so let's just start talking about the different examples, okay. Diplomonads is the ancient surviving lineage of eukaryotes. Okay, this is the kind of connection with the bacteria. They have two nucleuses. They have multiple flagella. The mitochondria lacks their DNA. They are anaerobic, and our example we have would be Giardia. And that's what it would look like. Okay. Now, there are three main types of protists. We have plant-like protists, which are the algae. They're photosynthetic. And again, plants would have evolved from the plant-like protists. We have animal-like protists, which we call protozoans, which ingest, they eat. And again, animals have, arrived, have evolved from animal-like protists. And then fungus-like protists are um, the ones like fungus. Um, they absorb their nutrients and so forth. So let's first talk about the plant-like protists. Our examples are algae and seaweed. They are small in size to be very barely noticeable, but then they can be as long as 100 meters long like seaweed. They are um, autotrophs or heterotrophs, okay? And they're a big source of food for freshwater and marine animals. We do classify them according to their color and structure. So the color comes from their pigments. Um, and we'll see that there's um, green algae, red algae, golden algae, and so forth. Now, plant-like protists first appeared on Earth about 550 million years ago. Um, algae are so important because half of all the photosynthetic production of organic material is achieved by the algae. Um, they all have the chlorophyll A in it, okay? 75% of the oxygen on Earth is produced by algae. So let's talk about the euglena, phylum euglena phyta. This is a unicellular algae that does have characteristics of both plants and animals, okay? They are autotrophs, however, if they are exposed to a period of darkness, they can become heterotrophs. So we call this a mixotroph. Okay? They don't have the cell wall. They do have that contractile vacuole to control water. They have an eye spot, um, which is a photoreceptor at the base of the flagella that will help sense the direction of the light source. So that allows the organism to swim toward or away from light to reach the optimum brightness. And they do move by flagella. So we will look at Euglena in class. You'll actually get to watch Euglena moving. Okay, so the next phylum is the golden algae. These are, again, unicellular. They have two flagella, both attached near one end of the tail. Okay, and their colors range from yellow green to golden brown, depending on the pigments they contain. Okay, um, they are considered freshwater plankton. And what's kind of cool about them is they do form cysts in the winter or dry summer days. And again, that is a nice evolutionary advantage. 
All right, the diatoms. Um, they can be in fresh and salt water, and they tend to float near the surface. Okay, um, their cell wall is made up of a glass-like material, silica, and what's kind of cool, it's like a glass box. When they die, the glass does not decay. Instead, it drifts to the ocean bottom where it collects and deposits, and we call that diatomaceous earth. Um, it's so important for us because we use this as an abrasive ingredient in scouring powders, cosmetics, toothpaste. We use it to filter, like pool filters or juice or so forth. Okay, so they're very important. And diatoms are very beautiful, very different um, shapes and sizes. Next, we have the phytoplankton. Um, there's about 1,100 species, and they typically are brown in color. They're unicellular. They could be marine or freshwater. Um, they do have two flagella. One moves the algae through the medium, and one spins the cell on its axis. Okay, they, um, they do form what are called red tides that occur, occur in the warm coastal water, and it does release toxins that kill many fish. Oh, the green algae. They could be unicellular, multicellular. Um, they do live in fresh water. Um, there's about 7,000 species that have been identified so far. Okay. Um, they can live in moist land or salt water and inhabit other or organisms, though. Okay. So one of the things about green algae is they do perform photosynthesis. Okay. They have those photosynthetic pig pigments. And they do make up lichens, and we'll talk about lichens in our next kingdom. Some examples are spirogyra, which is like a filament. Volvox is a globe-shaped colony. Ulva is a lettuce leaf. Okay. It's kind of like your pond scum that you see. The Volvox is very cool. All right, so the brown algae, this is the largest subphylum. This is the seaweed. Um, they are very complex, multicellular organisms. They live mainly in salt water. Um, they do contain um, chlorophyll and a brown pigment. Their main commercial source is for iodine, and iodine was used to clean wounds. Um, when I would go to the nurse, if I had a scrape, they would put iodine on, and you'd come out with a big brown arm. They do use them in surgery and so forth. And we have some examples. We have kelp, algin, laminaria, and sargassum. Kelp is a fertilizer or could be food for, for humans. Algin thickens ice cream. Laminaria is a root-like structure um, with like leaf-like parts. And sargassum kind of float unattached at surface at warmer water. And it does cover much of the Atlantic Ocean um, and the Sargasso Sea. Red algae um, is multicellular, lives in salt water, but it can live in fresh or land environments. Um, very bright red in color. It can look green in shallow water, and it can be black in deep water. Uh, very beautiful feathery shapes. Um, it can photosynthesize at great ocean depths. It can trap the blue light and photosynthesize at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, and some do have cell walls. So we use them for auger, which is a culture medium for growing bacteria and food. It's found in ice cream, puddings, cake icings, and so forth. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the animal-like protists, or the protozoans. Um, they are um, called protozoans because it means first animals. There's about 40,000 different species. They're unicellular. They can move, they don't have cell walls, um, they are heterotrophs, they consume bacteria detritus, um, they trap food, okay, and they are going to be classified by how they moved. Um, most of them live in water or moist soil or inside other organisms, okay. So the first one we'll talk about are the sarcodines. These are going to be protists that take in food by pseudopods. Um, we have further divided them into three phylums, okay, and we'll talk about each of those phylums. So the first one is the rhizopods. This is the amoeba. This is like, um, 
They are the simplest of the protists, they're unicellular, and they actually move by pseudopods, which is false feet. So the pseudopod is a false feet. Um, it's used for locomotion and golfing food. It's made by flexible plasma membrane and constant movement of the cytoplasm. Um, and it's there's cytoskeleton in there that also helps it move. It's very cool to watch. Um, they do eat by phagocytosis, so the food is surrounded by the pseudopod and brought into the cell for digestion. Um, it does have minimal skeletons, which make up the limestone and chalk on our Earth. Um, it does reproduce asexually by binary fission. It doesn't go through meiosis. Okay. So we will get to see the amoeba. You're going to love watching it, especially if we can see it move. And it does, it can make us sick if we're um, the amoebic dysentery. Um, it's spread by contaminated drinking water, food, or eating utensils. You get bloody diarrhea. It can be fatal. Okay. And you're going to love looking at the amoeba. Okay. So then we have the actinopods, the heliozoans, and the radiolarins. Okay, this typically makes up the plankton. Okay, and they do have axopods, which is a way that they can move. Okay, um, the actinopods means ray feet, and it's kind of spherically sym symmetrical. Um, the axiopods is slender radiating pseudopods that radiates out. Um, and again, they use those to feed and so forth. Okay, the forams, um, pretty much 90% are fossils. They're found in rocks and marine sediment. sediment. Um, they did live in sand or attach themselves to rock or algae. Uh, they do have porous shells of calcium carbonate, um, which is an important component of the marine sediment. Um, they were photosynthetic. They derived from um, symbiotic algae that lived beneath the shells. Um, and they do feed and move with their slender interconnected pseudopods that are spirally arranged. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the ciliates, paramecium and stentor. These are one-celled or unicellular organisms found in fresh water. They use cilia to move. Okay, they move them by beating the cilia, and they also use the cilia to get food by sweeping it into the cell. The cilia will often cover the entire surface of the cell. They can reproduce asexually or sexually. They do um, have a contractile vacuole, and they also have two nucleuses. There's a macronucleus and a micronucleus. Macronucleus is large. It controls the cell's metabolism, everyday functions, controls asexual reproduction, which is binary fission, makes up RNA. Where the micronucleus is small, and it only controls the cell's reproduction, which is conjugation. And that's the paramecium. We'll look at that. And we'll also look at the stentor, which you'll love. Okay. The flagellates. This is named for the whip-like flagella that they use to propel themselves. I could have one, two, or several flagella. And the flagella are used for motility and for feeding. They are unicellular. And they are heterotrophs. They absorb their nutrients from absorbing organic molecules from the surrounding area. Or they can engulf their food through phagocytosis. Um, one example is trypanosoma. This is what causes African sleeping sickness in humans. It's transmitted to humans by the tsetse fly. Um, and once the fly beach bites you, the um, trypanosoma will live in the blood of, your, of us. And it will release poisonous substances that attack the nervous system causing you to become very weak and eventually will lead to death. Um, and it will cause deadly encephalitis, which is the inflammation of the brain. So we are going to continue our notes on fungus in the next little, I'm sorry, not fungus, like protus. Um, so if you can just please um, turn on the second set of notes. Thank you.